Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program, this program which is dedicated to featuring the Bible, the Bible, God's holy book, God's law book to mankind. The most wonderful, the most prestigious book of all books. Fact is, we can't even put it in the same category with any other book. It stands way, way, way up there as being far more glorious and important and true uh, than any other book. Now, it is true, as we study the Bible, that God has given us rules to follow. And if we don't follow those rules, we can get a lot of wrong teaching from the Bible. God has written the Bible as a law book, and he has put within that law book the rules we are to follow in order to understand those laws. And if we don't follow the whole Bible, it can end us into a, a terrible uh, situation of still being under the wrath of God because the ultimate desire of the Bible is that we might become saved that we might become a child of God but uh, we if we're going to teach about that if we're going to learn from the Bible we have to follow the rules namely that the Bible is a spiritual book it is written as an earthly book but it, uh, until we find the spiritual meaning, we haven't really found it. You know, an outstanding example of this is what has happened to the uh, world of Christians in their treatment of those peoples of the world, uh, like the Arab nations, that uh, the Ara Arabia and so on, that are uh, descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. Uh, God it used uh, used Hagar, who was the wife of a, uh, the second wife of Abraham, uh, and who gave birth to Ishmael, as a picture of someone who is trying to uh, please God by his actions rather than waiting upon God to do what God plans to do, and uh, so God uses that uh, that. Uh, uh, situation that is described in Genesis uh, 17 and uh, through 25 uh, 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 to indicate we have to wait upon God. But, and the consequence of that action is spoken of in Galatians chapter 4 where God says in verse 30, Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The son of the free woman was Isaac, who, who was the progenitor of the Jewish nation. The son of the bondwoman was Ishmael, who is the progenitor of the uh, Arab nations and some of the other peoples of the world that lived in the same vicinity of Israel most of their most of their life and uh, because the, uh, the Christian theologians and so on of the past and even of the present did not understand that this is simply an illustration that God is not in any sense at all saying that you are if you are a descendant of Abraham through Ishmael therefore you cannot become a child of God God is absolutely not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, he has some of the most wonderful uh, promises you could ever imagine for the blood descendants or the spiritual descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. But in order to uh, understand those promises and, and, and be beneficiary of those promises, you have to follow the biblical rule that the Bible alone and in its entirety is the divine word uh, and that we are to understand that Christ spoke in parables. That is, the Bible is written as an earthly book and we have to find the spiritual uh, meaning of it. Now, let me give you an illustration. God gives a beautiful illustration of this here in uh, 
in Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. And this passage should cause anyone who is a blood descendant of Abraham through Ishmael to rejoice. Rejoice, because God is talking about these people uh, uh, who make uh, up most a uh, great part of the Islamic religion, where incidentally they serve Allah, and Allah is a name right out of the Bible about who God is. They believe, too, that the Bible is the Word of God, but uh, they, in order to find or benefit from these promises that we're going to be reading about, you have to uh, go all the way with the Bible. You can't go part way with the Bible. And, and from time to time, we'll be talking about that. But back in Isaiah 60, uh, God there is talking in in a tiny sense, a small sense, about the whole New Testament age uh, following the uh, crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Because in verse 9 he says, surely the isles, that is, and the isles is a reference to all all of the uh, continents of the earth, shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far and their silver and their gold with them. Now, right here, I'm going to break into what this is saying. It is simply saying that what is talked about here in Isaiah 60 began in a small way, in a small way, already when the gospel began to go out. And, and we're going to read in, in uh, uh, this chapter that, that uh, the, the, uh, it says in verse 4, Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together. They come to thee, that is, come to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Thy son shall come from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea, it's talking about our day particularly, although in a very tiny way it already began when the new church age began but the for the full force of this chapter is on our day and uh, the, the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee that is the forces of the strength of the nations will be coming in to the Lord Jesus Christ and then in verse 7 my 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 read this in verse 7, all the flocks of Kedar, flocks is a synonym for sheep, it, this word could be translated sheep, all the sheep of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee, they shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Now bear in mind, God wrote this. God wrote this. This is in the law book, the Bible. Now, why am I being so careful about this? Who are the the uh, sheep of Kedar and the rams of Nebaioth? When we go back to First Chronicles, and this is a principle we always follow in the Bible, if we're going to look for truth, again, it's following a biblical rule. We compare Scripture with Scripture. And when we go back to First Chronicles chapter 1, we read there in verse 29, These are the generations, uh, and he's talking about the generations of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, by Hagar. And we read, incidentally, in Genesis 16, that, or Genesis 15, that uh, Hagar became the wife of Abraham. And, the, and it says the, in First Chronicles 1, verse 29, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebaioth. Oh, remember we read here in Isaiah 60, the rams of Nebaioth. Then Kedar. Oh, Kedar was the second son. And Kedar, the flocks of Kedar, shall be gathered unto thee. In other words, God is saying 
that at this time in history, when the forces of the Gentiles are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, when uh, when uh, 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 when uh, the, the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising, as we read in verse three, included among them will be a great multitude of those who are descendants of Abraham through Ishmael, Kedar, and Abiah. Now we know that to some degree this began already uh, right at Pentecost, at the end of the at the beginning of the church age, because we read in in the book of Acts that when the Holy Spirit was poured out and and the disciples were uh, ministering there on that Pentecost afternoon, we read that. Uh, 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 all kinds of people were hearing the gospel in their own tongue, Cretes, and including Cretes and Arabians. Do we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? And they were all amazed. And on that afternoon, about three thousand were saved, which would have had to include some descendants from Ishmael. And and what a pity! that these verses had not been known all through the New Testament history. How could it be that, that the Christian public or the Christian world uh, began to despise the descendants of, Ishmael, of Abraham through Ishmael? God has wonderful things to say about them. And this is only the beginning. You know, we're just going to touch on this in this uh, open forum. This is an open forum, and there's a lot. Uh, we want to get your question. But I w wish that you would read carefully Isaiah 60, and uh, and uh, and look at these words very carefully. And they are wonderful promises for those who have never heard the gospel and also those who are blood descendants or even spiritual descendants uh, are looking spiritually at Abraham as their father through the line of Ishmael. And so I'll tell you, I'll tell you, God is going to be doing something wonderful in that area of this world. Uh, that includes those who are blood descendants of, Ab of Abraham through Ishmael and there are uh, many other references that we want to look at but right now uh, this is as far as we'll go at this moment we're going to look to you for your question so we'll take our first call on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum Harold yes this is John Allen from South Carolina yeah I have a question and a comment please the question is john the gospel according to saint john chapter 1 verse 9 would you let's look at that look john, at that verse please john 1 verse 9 there we read that uh it's talking about John the Baptist in verse 8. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So it's talking about the Lord Jesus, because he is the creator of the world. Now, what is your question? What does that mean, speaking of Christ, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world? I thought we were born into sin. What does it mean, how does Christ light every man that comes into the world? Well, that every man that is to be lighted, every, you know, the word every, the word every is a, or all, we have to be very careful with that. We have to uh, see how God uses that. Let me use as a given illustration. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read in verse, I think, 22, I believe it is, As in Adam, all or every one dies. 
And when we search the Bible, we know, yes, that includes every single human being. We're all descendants of Adam. We're all spiritually dead until God saves those that he plans to save. But then in the same sentence, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all, or everyone, be made alive. And, and so we have to think ordinarily as we look at this, when you have one sentence like that, well, if the first all includes every single human being, then the second all has to include every human being. But when we search the Bible, we find, no, that can't, that's not possible. Because if everyone was made alive, then nobody was, would be in hell. And it disagrees with all kinds of doctrines, the doctrine of election and uh, the teaching of election and, and so on, many, many other teachings of the Bible. So we know that second all is conditioned by what the rest of the Bible will allow. And the rest of the Bible will allow that so in Christ shall all that God planned to make alive will become alive. Uh, God does not put all those words in that sentence, but that's what it has to be understood. Otherwise, we're not going to be in, in harmony with the whole Bible. Now, the same thing is true here, where it says, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, we know that that uh, um, uh, the human race comes into the world spiritually dead, spiritually dead, spiritually uh, 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 without any life uh, of any kind. But we also know that the elect of God will all become lighted by the Lord Jesus. God will open their spiritual eyes and give them a brand new resurrected soul, and uh, they will be uh, uh, shining lights uh, to send the gospel out in the world also. And so we have to read this. That was the true light which lighteth every man that God planned to light that cometh into the world. And then we have harmony and, and we have ample reason to, uh, uh, to add that, uh, that additional piece of information in connection with all because of the way God employs the word all elsewhere in the Bible comment is uh, you use the word um, the fact is often I'm sorry you excuse me you use the phrase the fact is often and um, the fact is God is the authority and not you you should maybe not use that word use those words well is that not appropriate to, to say the fact is this or the fact is yes, that? Yes, sir. God is the authority, though, not you. Well, I know, but of course God is the authority. I have no authority at all. I say again and again, don't trust me. But when I, if, if, if the Bible says that Christ is God, am I wrong in saying the fact is Christ is God? It's not coming on my authority. It's coming on the authority of the Bible. And so we shouldn't hesitate to state that this fact exists or that fact ex exists if it is strictly based on what the Bible teaches. Thank you, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening. Uh, I wanted to make a couple comments. Uh, my family, uh, you know, we're worshiping at home on on Sunday and uh, we get a chance to listen to a lot of good things on family radio. On Sunday, there was an open forum that was recorded um, that was played. I don't know how old it, uh, how old it was, uh, but regarding Hebrews thirteen two, you correctly made the statement that the word angels in uh, verse thirteen two should actually be rendered. Um, messengers in that instance. Um, you know, at the beginning of the program, you were talking about rules for Bible study. Um, one of the things I don't think you're doing is that word angels in Hebrews 13, too, is the word angelos. And that's a transliteration when the word angels is left there. And proper rendering um, of the scripture would be that everywhere we see the word angels, the word should actually be made messengers. And you were saying that depending on each and every verse, you have to look at it and decide whether it's talking about angels or messengers, when in fact, 
and I'll say that word, in fact, the word should always be rendered messengers. Well, I'm sorry. Why... Excuse me. The, the fact is that it is, it can be rendered a, a messenger, it can be rendered angel, but it is a fact, <laughs> you're, I'm using that, that bad word again, it is a fact that in the Bible, when God puts the word messenger, uh, it, depending on the context, it can be an angel, it can be a human being, it can be Christ himself. He is the archangel. But uh, uh, if the context demands that it is an angel, then there's no, uh, no reason why it can't be uh, written down as angel, if that is certainly the context made messengers and in fact one of the things you said on the show is you were talking about satanic uh, in influences such as satan working through ouija boards and haunted houses and creaking doors and it's your it's your lack of rendering this word messengers in all instances that's leading you to faulty spiritual conclusions regarding understanding who the angels are the only angels that exist are god in his various manifestations that he came in as well as the dead believers who are in heaven. For example... Well, excuse me now, excuse me now. You are now uh, uh, you are drawing conclusions. You have decided there are no angels. Uh, the fact is, who in the world was singing the praises of Christ when, when the angels or when the shepherds were out in the field uh, that uh, night when Jesus was born, a heavenly host were singing. Who were they? Who were they? Were they uh, 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 God? And, and when we read Hebrews chapter 1, God talks about angels as being ministering spirits sent on behalf of those who, who, uh, he came, uh, who Christ came to save. And so you, you, I agree with you. You can find some verses and group them together and, and uh, maybe conclude that there is no such a thing as an angel. Uh, the, but the fact is, if we, get, if we put into play all the verses of the Bible, no, you're going to have problems with that. And, and for example, we know that uh, it speaks about the angels who fell when, uh, when, uh, 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 when Satan rebelled. Uh, he was a fallen angel. And there are those, for example, who try to make a big case that there is no no uh, actual Satan, uh, that that doesn't exist. And but uh, you can do all kinds of gymnastics with the Bible if you don't take into account everything in the Bible. But uh, when you but we have to constantly search the Bible and make sure that we're ready to face any and every verse in the Bible. Sir, can I respond to that? Are you familiar with the Young's literal translation of the Bible? Uh, I, I, I know of it. I have never okay. used it. No, Young's was a linguistic master of many, many languages. And in nowhere in his Bible does he ever use the transliteration angels. He well, excuse me. I'm going to stop you right now. Young is not God. He was a fine theologian, no question at all, but he was not God. There are people, for example, who use the Young's Concordance, and from time to time you will see a definition of a word. And when you really search the Bible, you sometimes you find that his definition is, looks quite accurate, but at times it's not quite accurate. And so our trust is not in young, my, my, any more than it's in me. It has to be in the Bible. And so I'm sorry, but, but uh, uh, that proves nothing at all, what Jung has to say. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, my first one is, does the Bible use symbols? Uh, does the Bible use symbols? Yes. Yeah, All the time God uses symbols. He, God spiritual, uh, gives spiritual or gives uh, uh, numbers as symbols. He gives uh, uh, the land of Canaan, for example, as a symbol of the kingdom of God. He gives Jerusalem as a symbol of the kingdom of God. Uh, he gives the number five to signify 
uh, salvation or God's judgment, uh, and so on and so on. God uses symbols all through the Bible because the Bible is written as an earthly book with a spiritual meaning, and that's what a symbol is. It, that we see the symbol in its earthly setting, but we have to know what it, does it signify? What is the spiritual meaning of that symbol? About the Holy Grail. I'm sorry? What about the Holy Grail? The Bible doesn't talk about the Holy Grail. That is not found in the Bible. You, mean the, you know, the chalice? I'm sorry? The chalice that Jesus had drank from? Oh, I don't know what... Uh, you know uh, what a denomination does uh, the words that they put forth uh, that's not what's trustworthy it's the Bible that's the authority and uh, we don't uh, we don't get our lessons from a denomination from because uh, a lot of their their uh, doctrines have been developed by man uh, the only place we can really trust is the Bible alone. The Bible doesn't use the term Holy Grail, so we don't have to pay any attention to that. Okay. But thank you uh, for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold. Uh, could God save every human being if he wanted to? If God had planned that, of course, but in order to do that already from before the foundations of the earth, because that is when Christ, uh, the God speaks of him as the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, he would have had to make certain that God is in the person of the Lord Jesus had paid for every sin of every person in the whole human race because God doesn't save people simply by fiat, by making a decree. God has to save people by being absolutely uh, uh, faithful to, his, to the laws of the Bible. And the laws call for eternal damnation as a payment for sin. So anybody that God decided to save God had to also make provision that God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus would pay for all of that individual sins. But some, so, God, so, so God does not want to save every human being? It was not his intention to save every human being. Uh, he, uh, he, he, hold on, I'll be, I want to finish answering that right after this message. There are many, many theologians and Bible teachers and people who really think they know the Bible who have the idea that God, uh, all he had to do was decide to save someone. He is, after all, King of kings and Lord of lords. He makes the law, and all he's got to do is decree, I think I will save that individual. And and then when we come along and teach the biblical doctrine that he elected only certain ones to salvation, they right away recoil and say, oh, come on, God could never do that at all. Well, the fact is, we must remember that God is under law. He has to obey the law of the Word of God. And in order to have anyone in eternally with him in the new heaven and the new earth, somehow that individual's sins had to be paid for. And the payment was enormous, enormous. It meant that someone had to endure the equivalent of being an eternity in hell on behalf of the sins of that individual, and otherwise God could not save them. Now, immediately uh, there are those who say, well, come on, why couldn't God have done that? Well, you know, I stand amazed. Why would God save me when I think of the enormous cost to God? Uh, that he had to endure the equivalent of eternity in hell for my sins. I don't deserve that at all. Yet, and we also know that even those he did not choose to save, God still is in deep sorrow. He is, 
God is not a, a just a, a vicious tyrant of some kind. Uh, well, I, I, I paid for these and I don't care anything about the rest. There's a dynamic relationship that we don't fully understand or appreciate at all. You know, G between God and the human race. We see Jesus, for example, weeping over Jerusalem. Jesus is eternal God. Jerusalem is on their way to hell because they will not obey God. They will not listen to the word of God. And God had not made a plan to bring the, them into his kingdom. And so he is weeping over them. Uh, we, uh, we find language like God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God just doesn't throw the wicked away. Fact is, He commands us. We are to love our enemy. And who's our enemy? Every, every human being in the whole world who is not saved uh, is our enemy. And we are to love them. And the love that God is talking about is we are to have a compassion upon them and have an intense desire that they might have the highest good, namely salvation. And, and, and in fact, you remember in Genesis chapter 8, he says, if any man murders a man, he has to forfeit his life. That's how, how, how important every human being is to God. If, if a man murders a vicious criminal, who maybe has done terrible things to him, if he murders him without proper uh, legal sanction, then God says, by rights, if you're going to follow my law, you should forfeit your life. Because mankind, that, that vicious criminal, was created in the image of God. We don't understand all of this, but through all of this, we know there's a mysterious dynamic relationship that God has with mankind and but we do know also absolutely that uh, uh, in order for God to save any one of us God himself had to pay an enormous price and so we really have to ask the question the more logical question is why in the world did God save any one of us? He created us perfect. We were all in the loins of Adam and Eve. And we, of our own volition, of our own will, rebelled against God in the face of the command that in the day you eat of that tree or that as you disobey me, you will surely die. And we know from the Bible that death was to be finally uh, found guilty of that sin and cast into hell forevermore and so we just have to marvel how is it possible that God would save me and not only me but a whole a whole a, a great multitude he's saving today which no man can number uh, that's really the mystery that's really the wonder not when we start accusing God of somehow or slandering God by saying, well, how come he doesn't save everyone as if salvation is, uh, is like falling off a log. All he has to do is say, I save you. God can not do that because his justice is perfect and God cannot violate that justice in any way. Is it true that God is not willing that any should perish? Of all of those that he has come to save, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all, that is all that he has elected to salvation, will become saved. There again, you see, if we don't read that verse in the light of the whole Bible, we're going to absolutely come up with a wrong conclusion, and that's what people do all the time. The, the, they begin by violating a fundamental rule of the Bible that we compare Scripture with Scripture to make sure that whatever conclusion we come to will stand the careful scrutiny of every other verse in the Bible that might relate. 
And the moment you try to make that conclusion stick, that he does not wish that any human being in the whole world perish, uh, 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 but that all should come and, and, and try to decide that God really will that everybody should uh, become saved, then you get into trouble. It is true that God commands us, the whole human race, to believe on him. He commands. He, uh, God, Christ said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he says, uh, he gave the rule. He said, repent and believe the gospel. What is the gospel? The whole word of God. All right. That's a command he gives to the whole human race. And when we start reading the Bible, we find uh, that God commands us to strive to try to get into the kingdom of God. But he also tells us, now you can't get in by your work at all. Don't put your trust in any work that you do. And, of course, if we try to uh, uh, say that our faith got us in, that's work that we do. That can't be. When we search it all out, we find that Christ had to do all the work to get us in. Okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, uh, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. I'm in, looking in uh, Second Samuel one, chapter one, uh, verse twenty-three. Second Samuel chapter one, verse twenty-three. Let me turn to that. Chapter one. Verse 23, we read, Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places, and so on. Now, what is your question? Okay, um, now I've heard you say before that Saul was not saved, but my question is, was Jonathan saved? From uh, everything we know in the Bible, he... Uh, There appears to be sufficient evidence so we can say of Jonathan that he was a child of God. Uh, I think we can make that case. Although, you know, God puts a lot of individuals out on the, uh, as illustrations of some aspect of his salvation plan without really telling us whether they they themselves were saved or not. Some, he gives very clear evidence that they were like David or Solomon or or Moses or Aaron or Miriam and so on but uh, but on the other hand a lot of times he, uh, in Saul's case for example we have plenty of evidence he was not a child of God and yet uh, he is being eulogized here by David because he was the king and the king was to be respected and honored and uh, and and David, even though uh, for the last probably 15 years of Saul's life, uh, he was chasing David all over the hills of Judea, trying to kill David, trying to murder David, because he had heard that David had been anointed by God to be the next king. And yet when it, when it finally came down to it, David shows the way we Christians are to are to live, and that is, we are never to hold uh, 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 grudges against anyone. We're never, never to think that way. We are to want the very best for each and every one. In 23, this, it says, and, they, and in their death they were not divided. That's why it was kind of confusing, I thought, maybe. Well, in their, that, that is true in the sense that, that uh, they died the same day in battle, their bodies. Uh, were, okay. uh, you know, this, this is, uh, I'll tell you, 
God did not write the Bible to be easily understood. He'll use Jerusalem speaking about those who are the, the real kingdom of God, and he'll use Jerusalem as, a, as being the, uh, the uh, uh, kingdom of Satan, depending on the context. And, and here uh, he can talk about us in our soul existence, uh, or he can talk about us in our body, and in their bodies they were not divided. Because I but know thanks. he said his, uh, they, uh, David and um, Jonathan were, souls were kindled together. That's why I was confused okay. with that. So, okay. okay. So well, thank, was, thank okay. you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I admire you, and um, I really get a lot out of when you talk about the Bible. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. And um, I just have a question. Um, I've believed in Jesus for years, and I do read the Bible. And I've sinned, and now I'm scared. I don't know. Does Jesus take away all your sins once you believe, accept him as your Lord and Savior? I, I missed your question. You, you, your question. Repeat your question, please. Um, once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, does He forgive you for all of your sins? You see, uh, this idea of accepting the Lord Jesus is a doctrine designed by men. It is not designed by God. It is designed by men. Uh, we don't accept the Lord Jesus. Uh, we try to get, become saved. We want to become saved. We're commanded to try to become saved. Uh, but the fact is, salvation is entirely God's work. And we don't know whether He had planned to save us until, unless we actually have become saved. Before we become actually saved, we have no idea for sure whether we are or whether God planned to save us. The Bible teaches that He elected us from before the foundation of the world, that is, those that He planned to save. <clears throat> he is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, that is, He uh, made payment for the sins of those that He elected long, long before these individuals were born, and thus He Com committed himself entirely that he someday he had to give them a new resurrected soul which is what happens when uh, we become saved but all of this work is Christ's work all of it and and the Bible warns not of works not yet. first of all it's impossible for us to do any work because the, the work of salvation had to have been all done by God and secondly uh, we uh, God we have to give him all the glory and God warns if we are trusting in any way of something we did then we are still under the wrath of God. It's a grievously serious place to be if we put our trust. Oh, I did this and I did that. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I sat on the prayer bench. I, uh, whatever, I never. And therefore, uh, God saw that and He saved me. In other words, I'm, uh, if I put my trust in any way, even the tiniest little bit, in what I have done, we are still under the wrath of God. We have to give Christ. It was His faith. He did all the work. Faith is work, and Christ did all the work to save us. Okay, I have another question. Um, I was born and raised Catholic, but I'm starting to stray away from the church because, like you said, um, like um, like the Catholic priests, they make up their own doctrines and stuff like that. And I believe, as you believe, that. You should only believe in the Bible. You're so right. I don't really go to church anymore, and like I'm starting to read the Bible more, and I I listen to um, uh, your show every night, and I do listen to um, back to the Bible too every day. So I'm a little confused about that. Well, no, you're right on the right track. You see, the only spiritual authority in the world is the Bible. Uh, there's no church doctrine, there's no church creed 
There's no denomination, there's no religion that has any authority to save us or have authority to claim that they have the truth. Only the Bible is true and trustworthy. And because uh, uh, by this time in history, the churches have uh, put so much trust in in what they teach rather than what the Bible teaches, God is now not not using the churches at all. He is He's saying, stay away from them. That's outside. That's where I am saving. And he's saving not because of our worthiness or anything. It's save, he's saving us by his uh, his sovereign decree that I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. But as we learn, uh, as, as we are, uh, if we want to be in a place where God can save us, if that's his good will to do, we want to only listen to the Bible. The Bible. Every, that's why, uh, you know, I quoted from Mark 115, where God, Christ commands, repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is the word of God. And to believe means to recognize that is truth. As best I can, I want to obey that. And when I read the Bible, I realize that I don't deserve salvation at all. I'm a sinner. I ought to be sent to hell. And yet I know that there's a great multitude that God is saving today. And I know that God is a merciful God. And I can beseech God and beg God and be completely in agreement with the Bible. As I beg, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Could it be? Could it be? that maybe I could become saved also if I'm not presently saved. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Howell. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm listening to your program for a good while, and uh, I really enjoy it mostly, but... Uh, I have a big, big problem with uh, 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 accepting the fact that the church age has ended in 1988, I believe, and uh, I would like if you could give me some explanation. And uh, before that, I would like to tell you that uh, I was saved in a church in uh, 1998. I was a prodigal son, you know, I... Uh, I left home and I went uh, to a different country that was back in Europe at that time. And, uh, you know, I went away from the Lord. Uh, you know, I, I was educated to follow Christ and all this. But uh, anyway, uh, to make it uh, short, I was saved in, in, a, in a church. That's where I listened to the message and that's where I, I gave my heart to Christ. So. Uh, I would like if you could give me some explanation how... Yeah, well, how but you see what you've just stated. I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is what your church has taught you. That is n not at all in agreement with the Word of God. We, we can't give our heart to the Lord Jesus. He has to give us a new heart. Let me read to you from Ezekiel chapter Ezekiel chapter 36 Ezekiel chapter 36 this comes right from the mouth of God where God is talking about his plan of saving any one of us he says in verse 24 of Ezekiel 36 I will take you now this is God speaking now, he's not talking about me speaking he's talking this is God saying this I will take you from among the heathen that's where we all are before we're saved. We're with the, uh, with the nations of the world that, are, that are, are still in rebellion against God. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And that's the land that God has ordained for those that he elected to save. It is the kingdom of God. Then will I... Notice it's constantly God doing the work. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. What water is that? Christ spoke in parables. So we have to look at the spiritual meaning. It is the water of the gospel. As we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith 
And that's a synonym for Christ. Cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that is this water that is sprinkled upon us by God. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you, God is saying. Now notice the next phrase. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. You see, God has to do all the action. Uh, we don't. We don't. Uh, we don't have anything to do with ourselves being saved. God has to do all of it. And as a matter of fact, when we uh, look at this in the light of the whole Bible, we know that this was all done for us uh, long before we were born. And it's just a matter of now, at some point in our life, before we die or before the end of the world, that. He gives us that new heart, which means we have become saved. And from that point on, we have an intense desire to to uh, be obedient to everything the Bible teaches. But it's all God's work. And if, if, if we're thinking in our mind, I gave my life to Christ. I accepted him. I prayed the sinner's prayer and he saved me. I was baptized and uh, I went down in the water with my sins and I came up without my sins. I was baptized as a baby and that brought me into the covenant. I, whatever, any phrase like that is not in the Bible. Yeah, all of those phrases come from theologians who do not and have not understood what, what salvation really is, that it is the enormous work of God making payment for our sins, which he did so long before we were born. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Uh, my name's Dan. I'm calling from Long Island, New York. Um... I really enjoy listening to the conversations you have with the callers. It's 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 such a great blessing because <clears throat> you know life is so hectic. We have to work our jobs or 40 hours a week or overtime, and 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 sometimes we just don't have time to sit down and read the Bible and 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 to be able to turn on the radio and just get all this spiritual food is is, is such a great blessing to me and. Uh, Boy, oh boy. You know, I, I can get, I get two of your stations because I'm in central Long Island. I, if, if you have technical problems with WFME, I can actually get WFRS. And, and, uh, you know, what a merciful and loving God we have. You know, and it just, it, it just blows me away that I can get all this spiritual food. I kind of think of <clears throat> well, you're the just, story, you're the just story want... about the, the you just want to praise God, praise God that that uh, God has uh, is allowed this to happen, that family radio exists, and that you are blessed by the Bible as we try to faithfully declare what the Bible is saying. And if anything, pray, pray the Lord that we will remain faithful and that we'll never, never let man's ideas get in the way of the truth of the Bible. And I'm glad to hear that you are rejoicing in what the Lord has done for you. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, good evening. I'm um, Harold Campion. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Um, Harold Campion, I've got a question. Um, I'm a Lutheran, um, and um, in our church, we actually recite the Apostles' Creed, um, and it is very biblical. However, at the very last part, it says that Jesus descended into hell, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures. Could you please tell me where in the Bible it actually says that? And well, I'll take you, your answer off the air. You know, Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, that creed, the Apostles' Creed, is probably the oldest creed that exists in the churches. 
and uh, it is quite biblical it's more biblical it's very short creed and uh, and it turns out it's quite biblical uh, but but when you ask anyone who recites that creed and it's recited very very frequently in certain churches uh, and certain denominations and ask them what does it mean that Christ descended into hell they have no idea no idea but in a, in the Bible, and yet it is a very biblical statement we read in Ephesians chapter 4 that Christ went down uh, uh, this, well let me turn to that a moment in Ephesians chapter 4 we, we read that uh, uh, 9 verse 9 now that he ascended what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things now the lower parts of the earth again remember the, the, uh, 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 the whoever wrote the apostles creed at least had some understanding uh, correct understanding that we interpret scripture by the scripture and that Christ spoke in parables because the lower parts of the earth is a synonym for hell you see, hell is to be under the wrath of God. Oh, my. I have to pause for this message. I'll get right back to this. When the Bible uses the phrase lower parts of hell or uh, 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 descended into the earth, uh, God is speaking about hell. That's a synonym for hell. And hell is to be under the wrath of God. Now, Jesus in order to save us any individual take any individual who became a child of God it was necessary that Jesus endure the equivalent of an eternity in hell on behalf of that person now that person before Christ saved him is under the wrath of God he where he is in hell that's why he says in verse 8 of Ephesians 4 when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. We were captives of our sin. We were of sin. We were captives uh, under the wrath of God. And Christ found us in hell, as it were. That is, uh, he endured the wrath of God on our ha behalf and brought us out of hell, those that he planned to save. And that's why the Apostles' Creed summarize that in the statement he descended into hell that is he endured the wrath of God on behalf of those he had come to save and it's a very accurate statement but unfortunately it was not very well understood uh, during most of the church age but thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. I have a question about Hebrews 11, really verses 36 through 40. Hebrews 11:36. Let me turn to that. Hebrews 11:36. There we read, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise God having provide some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect it's really verse 39 that I'm talking about in other words what happened here I mean in other words some people got a good you know received the promise by faith and uh, others had a good report and they didn't receive the same promise I'm just confused with the language yeah, it's very difficult language. God has not made it easy right there, and, and that's not typical. Uh, we find that situation. Uh, uh, but you see, the 
the uh, the promise identifies with the fact that we have to receive a resurrected soul first and then a resurrected body now actually the efficacy of the cross reaches all the way back to the very beginning because Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world but they had no knowledge really knowledge at all of what salvation was they didn't know nearly as much as we know or as much as what is being taught here in Hebrews and uh, and uh, only when Christ uh, it, it uh, l l l l let me say it from this standpoint nobody can be raised from spiritual death until Christ is raised from death. He is the first fruits uh, because he rose, we rose. We were, we were like we read earlier, captivity uh, came for. Uh, he, he led captivity captive. In other words, he brought the captives out of hell when he arose. And so, in that sense, only in that sense, they had not received the promise because Christ had not risen as yet uh, until until uh, uh, we read about in uh, in 33 A.D. as we're reading it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that he had actually arisen. Although in principle, the efficacy of the cross went all the way back to the beginning so that in another sense they had received the promise but insofar as the factual uh, the facts of it uh, it was true that Christ had to actually come and 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 face the wrath of God and actually physically literally endure the punishment of it being uh, which was equivalent to an eternity in hell and and uh, that's the way we have to understand this. This is not an easy verse. This is a verse that that we have to uh, we we, have, we can only go so far with it because otherwise we're going to come up with a wrong statement. But we do know that the principle that God is emphasizing is that He is the first fruits. He is the firstborn because He rose, we rise, and. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that when Christ was hanging on the cross, and we read the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, and Christ said, it is finished. Now that meant the penalty was fully paid in actuality, although in principle, like I say, it reaches all, to, all the way to the beginning of time. But... But uh, here he, uh, he actually now had literally endured the wrath of God. In, uh, as he is saying, oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And as he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup might pass from me? He was drinking and experiencing in a very literal way the equivalent of eternity in hell only because he was God as well as man could God put upon him at that time a, actually an infinite punishment in order that he might pay in an infinite way for those who he had come to save and then isn't it interesting that right after he said it was finished and the veil of the temple was rent the graves were open where the graves were open then what do we read after Christ arose the bodies uh, I think you read this uh, uh, in Matthew 28 after Christ arose that was Sunday morning then the bodies of people of these broken open tombs uh, they rose and went into the holy city and appeared unto many in other words, God is emphasizing a point. First Christ, he's the first fruits. These people who rose on that Sunday morning uh, could, could rise because Christ has risen. 
Uh, and when they went into the holy city, the only holy city after the veil of the temple was rent is the city of Jerusalem in heaven. They went into heaven in their glorified resurrected bodies, the same as we will on the last day when we receive our glorified resurrected bodies. And I think that's the sense that we have to read here, that they had not received the promise in in in. Yeah, only from the, from the standpoint that we're looking at it here. But thank- that, was, that was very good. Thank you very much. On First Peter 1, we read language that they, they prophesied, you know, in old times, like, by the Spirit of Christ. And then yeah. we have in uh, Second Peter, it tells us that they prophesied, also, you know, Holy men of old spoke as they were, you know, led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Is the Spirit of Christ, well, we know, and the Holy Ghost, I'm sure they're one, but are they one and the same? I mean, it's difficult language. You know, the that, moment... That's the I, only time where I see... Well, you know, the moment we talk about God, we got to, we're walking on really holy ground. We have to be very humble. Our, uh, with our little peanut mind, which is still far superior to the mind of an animal, but yet compared with the man mind of God, it is just a tiny little thing. And our minds were not designed so that we can understand God. And when God talks about himself as uh, there is one God, that's absolutely true. Uh, as the Mohammedan, uh, as the uh, Islamics have correctly stated, uh, uh, Allah, Allah, that's that's one God. That's absolutely true. But God also speaks of Himself as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God uses a plural term, Allah Him or Elohim, which means God's. And we can't reconcile that. God talks about the Holy Spirit. And he actually, uh, we look at Jesus at the time he is being uh, baptized in there by John the Baptist in preparation uh, to be, as he's called, uh, announced as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We hear a voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son. Here is Christ, who is the beloved Son. Then we see the Holy Spirit coming down and descending on the Lord Jesus as a dove. How can all this be? We can't figure that out at all. We don't, we don't even want to try to figure it out because we have to very humbly recognize, no, God did not design us with a mind that was capable of understanding such a magnificent and complex God. We just know it is true because God has said so, even though we can't fit it all together. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, You're saying that God's law uh, requires that the sinner be punished with uh, eternity in hell. That's God's law. That is God's law. So, but so the fact that God has punished Himself rather than punished the sinner isn't that already a violation of God's law? Since He's punished somebody other than the than the sinner. No, it, you see, it seems it, like uh, a legal technicality to me. Oh well, now uh, uh, it's all right. To, uh, the fact is, God is very careful that everything is legal. Why do you suppose God had to take on a human nature? It is because man sinned, and God could not make payment for his sins as God. He had to also uh, be also a human being. He could not call upon a thousand uh, animals to make payment. He could not call upon the angels to make payment. It had to be man who made payment because it was man who sinned. That was an integral part of the justice of God's law. And so Christ had to go through the enormous misery, humiliation of identifying with miserable mankind who had rebelled against God by taking on a human nature. 
And and the curious thing and a wonderful thing and the awesome thing is that once he took on a human nature, he has one throughout eternity future. Because there's nothing in the Bible that says that after he finished paying for our sins, he shed his human nature. No, we read in First John that when we see him, we will be like him. And uh, so, but that 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 whole business of of, of humiliating himself this way uh, by taking on a human nature and identifying with miserable, rebellious mankind was required in order that God's law be strictly kept. God is uh, God is perfect in all that He does. If this is the sort of convoluted. Uh, conclusion that you have drawn from what you're reading in the Bible, it's a wonder that you're presumed to be able to understand anything in the Bible since it's all just so, it's complete balderdash. Well, it isn't balderdash at all. That's the point. That, that, that it's just the opposite. The, the, more, the more we study the Bible and recognizing it is the Word of God, and then we see a phrase in one part of the Bible that we wonder about and we're reading in a totally other part of the Bible uh, something that just fully explains that phrase and fits that right into its proper niche or place in that verse in which it is found we have to say oh my only God could have written this Bible the way he did and that happens all the time all the time uh, the more you study the Bible and compare Scripture with Scripture, the more uh, you, the more you have to stand in absolute awe. But to begin with, as we start reading the Bible, it looks like it's got contradictions. It looks like it's got uh, phrases that don't make any sense. It just seems so impossible, and God purposely wrote it that way so that those who in their pride... And I'll tell you, we humans have a lot of pride, and they don't want to humble themselves. They're never going to find the truth. But if we come with, you know, the Bible says a broken and a contrite heart, I will not despise. And so if we come to the Bible, oh, Lord, I don't know anything at all. You have to teach me. And, oh, Lord, guide me that I will, I will be faithful altogether. Then slowly on, we begin to see how the little pieces fit together beautifully. I, it reminds me of doing a, a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle, and you find that little piece. You don't know where to put it. And then finally, there's a place that you put it. It belongs there. It finishes up the picture. And, uh, and that's exactly... Uh, 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 the way the Bible is, everything fits together perfectly. Although, in great humility, we have to admit that when God is talking about God, now wait a minute, can we understand a God who could speak and bring this magnificent universe with all of its complexities, all of its beauty of animals and fish and jellyfish and frogs and mosquitoes and everything, of course not. We can't understand that. So, very humbly, we say, ah, oh, we don't understand all of that, but oh my, how it, marvelous it is when we can understand this verse finally, or that verse finally, and find that it fits perfectly into the whole matrix of what the Bible is. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, and thank you for taking my call. I have a couple of questions. The first one is about uh, you first in the beginning of this program claim that Allah is of God. I have uh, a message here that says there is uh, this Allah that is found uh, that could be possibly derived from Allah, Allah uh, which is an Arab uh, deity. There's 360 of them, and Allah is one of the top ones. Well, no, the, the, of, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, religion uh, of Islam, they believe that the whole Bible is the word of Allah. And God uses the word Allah many times, particularly if you go through 
uh, if, if it were, were the Aramaic words, the original Aramaic words that are found in Ezra and some are found in Daniel, uh, God uses the word Allah, the very word that the uh, Islamics use, Allah. And they bow down before Allah. Now, they uh, have violated the Bible the same as the churches. They, they call themselves Christians have violated the Bible. They don't realize uh, that the Bible is a spiritual book, and, and we have to uh, find the spiritual meaning. Any, there, there are no different than the churches have done the same thing. And many churches have added to the Word of God, add, like, uh, uh, like the Roman Catholics. They believe that the visions of Fatima are from God, or the... Uh, uh, charismatics believe that God is still bringing messages and visions. They're, they've fallen into the same snare. Uh, but the fact is, they start with God, they believe uh, in the Bible, and the Bible has many wonderful things to say about them today. And that just is exciting beyond measure. And slowly on, I'd like to unfold some of these things, maybe for a few minutes at the beginning of a program. And, uh, and we can see that there's a wonderful, wonderful hope provided, like any of us. We have to first of all recognize it's the Bible alone, al alone and in its entirety, that we have to follow. And if we follow the rules of the Bible, then God makes particular mention of the descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. And that is really marvelous and wonderful that they too have such an enormous hope that they are not even aware of at this point. But I hope that through the word of God, uh, they will become aware of this. Okay, but uh, what I understand, yeah, in their Allah, they have a, a messenger named Muhammad who was born in Mecca, which is uh, 570 A.D. That could not be the Christ. Oh, excuse me, they it, don't speak of him as the Christ. They speak of him as the prophet. Uh, they don't recognize Christ as the Son of God because, but, but my... When I think of all the do-it-yourself people or who are getting saved by their own action, they claim, oh, Christ is God, Christ is God. But they, uh, the fact is they're not trusting Christ for their salvation. They're, they claim they are, they think they are, but actually they're trusting their own actions. I accepted Christ or I got baptized and I became saved or whatever else it may be. So effectively they're denying Christ. Uh, and just as uh, the Islamics are also denying Christ, they're looking upon him as a prophet. But once they begin to realize, and, I, and the Bible predicts, this is a prediction of the Bible. What I just read from Isaiah 60, that's a prophecy of the Bible that applies to our day. Uh, in the main, uh, uh, although it was already somewhat fulfilled already throughout the church age, but now it's going to be fulfilled in a big way uh, as, uh, as we, as we uh, look at other passages of, of the Bible that speak about this. And, and it is, but it's based on them finally recognizing the Bible alone. Allah, Allah, yes. But, but eventually they will learn and, and uh, Christ, too, is God. But that will come as God opens their spiritual eyes. We can't force that on anybody. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, there's a glorious future for these dear people that have been so maligned by the Christians throughout the church age. It's really a shame the way they have been maligned. But now there is a great hope for them. But thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hello um i was reading the book of ruth yes and um in in some of the language it seems to be talking about the end of the world like in uh, ruth 2 verse 7 it says and she said i pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. And that word gather is Strong's number 622 Hebrew word, and it usually has to do with the end of the world. 
And then in uh, chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about um, more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. And I'm just wondering, um, have you done any study on this? And, and who uh, is Ruth a picture of the believers? And then who is a picture of Naomi and Boaz? Well, I, I, I've, I've, I've worked through the book of Ruth long ago uh, in very great detail. Uh, at that time, of course, I did not have knowledge of of this final tribulation period when there would be a great multitude being saved. But I don't think the book of Ruth is focusing on our day. Uh, we know that Boaz is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kinsman redeemer. And Naomi is a picture of national Israel who produced Christ. He is the uh, he is the first he is the uh, uh, the uh, fruit of the vineyard that uh, that God when God used national Israel he spoke, uh, spoke of them as a vineyard and they did it did bear fruit that was the Lord Jesus Ruth is a picture of anyone who becomes a believer she was a Moabite and the Moabites are used by God as a picture of those who can never, never come to salvation. And uh, that is true of every human being because we're spiritually dead. There's no way that any human being can get himself saved. We are dead, dead, dead spiritually. But yet here is Ruth the Moabitess that's repeated again and again and again that she became a child of God and even became the progenitor of the Lord Jesus. And so there's some mighty wonderful spiritual lessons that are developed in the book of Ruth. But I don't uh, remember anything there that might relate to the end. Okay. And then just um, I had a, one more question, and that was kind of a, just a general uh, um, uh, overview of the climate of the world. Like, I was wondering how... Uh, was, was there evidence in the fossil record that might show that there was a lot of ferns or that the earth was warmer and before the flood? And where does the ice age come in? And so maybe there's not global warming. Maybe it's just going back to the way the world was once. You know, did, did the ice age come after, and how long was it? Well, uh, the Bible doesn't really talk about an ice age. Uh, but we know from the geological record that there was an ice age. Uh, when we work through the calendars of the Bible, uh, we know that there were enormous changes that, uh, that uh, occurred uh, because of the results of the fact that the whole world is covered above the highest mountain of that day with water and then the ocean basins are deepened and so on and uh, and uh, in the fossil record there are areas like in uh, uh, which now have been covered by ice that uh, that they have found plenty of evidence that one time it was much warmer and that probably was before the time of the flood the likelihood and it fits quite well in the geological timetable as we've corrected based upon what the bible teaches that probably for maybe several hundred or a thousand years after the flood there were great a great uh, movement of, of uh, flow of temperature changes that produced the ice age. And in fact, we know from the geological record that at one time the, the uh, continents were covered. I think, I think the figure is about 32% uh, of the continents were covered with ice. And that would have been about 6,000 years ago between six and seven thousand not more than seven thousand probably a little closer to six thousand years ago and now it's only they're covered about ten percent so there's always been a gradual warming i have to i would come to the end of our program so i have to say good night until our next open forum may the lord richly bless you good night